Welcome back. This week's topic is feature engineering. What is feature? Feature extraction is the practice of enhancing machine learning by finding characteristic in the data that helps us solve a particular problem. Let's see how we can convert time series forecasting into a supervised learning task and what kind of features can we extract for input. So first, let's review a couple of terminology concepts. So time series analysis, in our primary objective is to develop a mathematical models with plausible descriptions from sample data. We're making assumptions about the form of data. We're also decomposing time series into component. We've seen it earlier in the trends, seasonality, and noise. Forecasting involves taking our models on historical data and using it to predict future observations. So we can use those components, right? Time series components, and we can apply traditional statistical methods to make predictions. Let's look at supervised learning. First, we use labeled data sets. We train algorithms for classification task or predicting outcomes. Time series forecasting, with its main goal to predict future observations, in fact, can fit very well and can be framed as a supervised learning problem. So in the typical supervised learning data, we will have input, some X features, and we will have output, Y feature. And our goal is to map function from the input variables, input features, to the output. So given a sequence of numbers in our data set, in time series data set, we can, in fact, restructure data to look like a supervised learning problem by using sliding window. So we take previous timestamps, let's say um, 100, and it becomes input variable for x. The next time step is our output variable, and so on. We preserve the order between our observations. However, we do need to remove a couple of rows, as for instance, in the row, the first row, and in the last row, we will not have a previous value, right, to make it as a input, and the same in the last row, we will not have a future next value to use it as um, output. So features are basically our input variables. So in our traditional time series, we do not have really input and output features, but we must choose variables which must be predicted and also choose variables that will become our features. So how can we construct our typical time series data with one column? Typically it's our time attribute, right? There are several types in feature engineering that we can implement. First, we can look at date time component. So these are components of time steps itself in each observation. We can use lag features. These are values at prior time steps. We can use window features. This is a summary of values over a fixed window taken from prior steps. Finally, we can look at STL features and we can measure strength of trends or strength of seasonality. So date time related features are special type of categorical variable. We have a specific point in our timeline. So in order to engineer properly a date feature, we need to have some domain knowledge or a deeper understanding of the problem. For instance, studying energy consumption time series. We might ask ourselves, is there any relationship between date time and consumption? And based on our prior knowledge in personal consumption, 
We know that the use of energy, for instance, is lower at night compared to daytime. So perhaps the feature of night, a binary feature, would be appropriate feature to add to our time series. Domain specific features varies from minutes, hours, business hours, for instance. We can look also at the weekends or daylight saving, etc. And these values do not have to be raw. It can be a binary, like a binary flag. So true will be one and false will be zero. So taking, for instance, this timestamp, we can construct the following features. We can extract month, day of the month, day name, for instance, hour. And let's say in this case, an example of energy consumption, we want to have a feature, whether it's a night or daytime. So we can include night equals zero. And if we look at the weekend, additional feature that we may use, we can include weekend equal zero as well. Another interesting concept to look at is time spans. Does every year have 365 days? Does every day have 24 hours? And how about every minute? Does it have 60 seconds? There's many parts of the world that use day, uh, daylight saving time. So some days may have 23 hours and others may have 25. But also some minutes may have 61 seconds, but sometimes leap seconds are added because the Earth rotation is gradually slowing down. So in time spans, we can distinguish between duration and duration is always recorded as a time span in seconds. Periods are time spans, but without a fixed length in seconds. We just use some human times like days or month. And we have intervals. They have starting and ending points. So the question, how do we pick between duration, periods, and intervals? As always, pick the simplest data structure that will solve your problem. And if you only care about physical time, try to use duration. If you need to add some human times, like days or month, use period. And if you need to figure out how long a span is, then use interval. Let's look at lag features. Lag feature is a classical way that time series forecasting problem can be transformed into supervised learning problem. The lag features are the target or output, but shifted with a period of time, day before, a week, or month. And the simplest approach is to predict the value at the next time. For instance, given t, predict the value for next step, t plus 1. So we can shift our data set. Let's say this is our data set. Let's shift the data set by 1. So it will create a t column and t plus 1 column. We will have to add none value for the first row because the value is unknown, right? We don't know the previous value prior the very first timestamp. So we can have a lag of 1, for instance, lag of 3, etc. The main difficulty with this sliding window approach is to decide how large to make the window. A good starting point would be to try various window sizes. We can also add a common short summary for our data set to compute five summary statistics. And these are typically minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum. And we know that correlation may also exist. An average may also vary from one day to the next. So rolling calculation, apply function to a fixed width subset, and we'll have one observation for each window size. There's a common way to um, use rolling calculation. We can measure central tendency over time using mean, median, for example. We can measure the volatility over time, the variation over time, standard deviation, variance. We can also detect changes in trends, looking at how fast or slow how moving averages are. And we can measure relationship between two time series as um, covariance or correlation. 
So moving average is the most common example of our rolling window. By varying window size, we can see how fast or slow our moving averages are. So in this example, we have three month rolling window calculation. So what moving average allows us to do is to visualize how an average changes over time, which is useful to see noise or to detect trend. And we can also compare fast and slow moving averages. We talk about time series decomposition. It can be used to measure the strength of trend in seasonality. Recall that our decomposition formula is combination of trend, season, remainder component, noise. So in classical decomposition, we assume that seasonal component is constant, right? And classical decomposition is not able to capture seasonal changes over time. Instead, we can use seasonal and trend decomposition using Lewis method, which is more robust, also robust to outliers and allows us to see the change, seasonal component changes over time. So we will be using STL to extract features. All right, so if we have strongly trended data, we expect that our seasonally adjusted data will have more variation than remainder component. So trend plus remainder component in denominator and variance of remainder component and nominator. We have strong trended data. It will be close to one. If our data has no trends or very little trends, that these two variances should be approximately the same. And overall, the strength will be close to zero. For seasonality, we will define our detrended data combined with remainder. And similarly, data with no seasonality, we would expect to have strength of zero. And data with seasonality will be close to one. These measures can be useful, for example, when you have a large collection of time series and you need to find out series with the most trends or the most seasonalities. We can also look at different features altogether and see if there's any correlation between them. This is a pairwise plot of groups of features using Australian tourism data. So the purpose of trips is mapped to colors. And there is a couple of interesting already observations based on this pairwise plot. All right, let's look at the, so blue is the holiday trips. So if you look at this plot, you notice the strongest seasonal strength is represented by holiday trips. In the bar plots, another interesting observation, business trips, which is orange, show some seasonal peaks in business travels in the quarter three and in the quarter one. Finally, when we have a lot of dimensions, when we have a lot of features, right, we have a lot of dimensions. Using dimension reduction technique, such as principal components, is often useful. We can represent principal components, which are a linear combination of variables, as a principal component one, the first component with the most coverage explanation of data variation, and principal component two, the second most important component to explain data variation. So the color, again, coded or mapped to different types of purposes, business, holiday, others, and visiting. There are two notable observations. If we look at principal component two on the y-axis, we notice that blue, which is holiday, holiday trips behave differently. The second interesting observation is that we have we have four outliers. And if you look specifically to what outliers are, Melbourne, South Coast, business holiday, etc., we can look closely at this four time series. If you look at holidays in Victoria, for instance, typically holiday trips have seasonality. However, this time series 
is not strong representing seasonality. So our key takeaways that time series can be in fact reframed as a supervised learning task and feature engineering can help us extract additional information to build our input features, which can include date time features, the special type of categorical variables, and these features can be domain specific. We can include lag features, which are values from prior steps, and we can decide what window size is needed. We can add rolling window statistics, calculating stats for a given window length. And finally, STL features can help us measure and represent the strength of trends and seasonality, especially when we want to compare different time series. All right, that's it for now. See you soon.